When director Bill Lustig worked on Maniac Cop, he always envisioned it as a franchise. He wanted the sequel to be a direct continuation of the story started in the original. Even though Maniac Cop was a hit, the studio that financed it, Shapiro Glickenhaus, passed on doing a sequel. Lustig continued directing and did two very successful action crime thrillers, Hit List and Relentless. He was contacted by a production company in the UK that had acquired the sequel rights from Shapiro Glickenhaus, and they were excited to finance Maniac Cop 2. Even though this was what Lustig wanted, he was still nervous. He hadn't done a sequel before, and in the past there had been a track record of sequels that were good, but never surpassed the original. He took that drive and set out to make Maniac Cop 2 bigger and better than Part 1. The budget for Maniac Cop was $1.3 million. The budget for Maniac Cop 2 was $4 million. With that much money, it allowed Lustig and company to do all the things they couldn't afford to do in the original. Lustig contacted the writer of the original, Larry Cohen, and brought him on board to write the sequel. It was now 1989. There was a legal issue that brought pre-production to a halt. During this time, while the legal stuff was being worked out, Lustig went to Paris for a film festival. While there, he saw a billboard for the new Bond film, License to Kill. Prominently featured on the billboard was the villain, Robert Davi. Lustig had a meeting with some of the financiers about Maniac Cop, and they asked him who he had cast a star in the sequel. He thought for a minute, and told them Robert Davi which made them all very happy. So when Lustig got back to LA, he immediately called Davi's agent and sent him a copy of the script for Maniac Cop 2. Even Ed Cohen had some more material for his character, Detective Sean McKinney. Davi called him back and was interested in working with him. He said, I'd love to work with you, but does it have to be Maniac Cop 2? Davi had just recently done Raw Deal, License to Kill, and Die Hard, three AAA big budget features, so he was a little nervous about the prospect of doing a blatantly B-movie. While they were talking, Davi was in the middle of the jungles of Brazil, filming the movie Amazon. Lustig told him he'd have a nice hotel room for him here in New York, as opposed to wherever he was staying in the jungle. He also sold the movie to him as Frankenstein meets the French Connection. He let him know he'd be the star of the film, so Davi agreed. The script called for Jack Forrest and Teresa Mallory to return, so they cast Bruce Campbell and Lorraine Landon again. Robert Zadar happily came back as Matt Cordell, the maniac cop. Cohen wrote Cordell to be a serial killer, so who better for him to befriend than another serial killer? With that in mind, Lustig cast Leo Rossi to play the killer, Turkle. For the role of Edward Doyle, he cast Richard Crenna. Crenna had to drop out because of personal reasons, so Rossi told Lustig he was friends with character actor Michael Lerner and could get him to play the part. Claudia Christian auditioned for the role of Susan Riley. She'd recently had a part in the movie The Hidden, and the producers liked her. Lustig wanted to go with someone else, but the studio pushed for her to be in the film, so he cast her in the role. Smaller parts in the film included Clarence Williams III as Blum, Danny Trejo in a very early role as one of the prisoners, and James Earl Jones' father Robert as Harry. Moving forward, Lustig wanted to have the definitive look of the maniac cop. Jason had his hockey mask, Michael Myers had his, Freddy Krueger had his look, so he worked with makeup artist Dean Gates on Cordell's appearance. Since at the end of the first film he was given a watery grave, they pruned his skin up like someone who was in the water for too long. While we see the hand come out at the end, it's never clear how long he stayed under before he resurfaced. Also, it's never stated, but it's kind of assumed that he's returned from the dead. So they rotted away his skin, hair, and gave him a grayish complexion. He was then designed to have a look reminiscent of the Phantom of the Opera. Gates also made sure to match up the scars from the first film. With the legal issues cleared up, they were able to move ahead with filming. It was November of 1989, and they were scheduled to shoot in New York and Los Angeles. It was more expensive to shoot in New York, so the bulk of the film would be shot in L.A. Lustig wanted the film to have the spirit of the old 30 serial films, so the opening of Maniac Cop 2 was the ending of Maniac Cop 1. Like the first, Lustig shot the film to have a film noir vibe to it. For the sequel, Lustig had a major surprise in store. Bruce Campbell and Lorraine Landon survived the first film, but he felt their story had run its course, so he had them both killed in Part 2. When Cohen wrote the script, Landon was supposed to survive, but would be in a coma. Lustig killed that character, but ended up having another character in a coma, which I'll talk about when I cover Maniac Cop 3. For the character of Turkle, Lustig wanted him as sort of an homage to the Universal Monsters. He told Rossi to grow his beard and hair out, and gave him a look like Bela Lugosi in Son of Frankenstein. Sort of a white trash Igor. While they did film what they could in New York, they shot most of the stunts in West New York, which was in New Jersey. It was getting close to Christmas, which ended up being beneficial to the production. They had numerous cops on hand, happy to close off streets, redirect traffic, and whatnot. Why? 
because all of this was giving them tons of overtime right before the holidays. So when they had a crazy stunt lined up, like a taxi cab driving down the street on its rims, they turned a blind eye. While they were filming, Christian became increasingly difficult to work with. She didn't get along with Dobby at all, and ignored the direction Lustig was giving her. He told her to play the character one way, but she would argue that the character should be played her way. For some reason, unbeknownst to Lustig, Christian refused to do any of the action scenes. They had to fight in order to get her to do the work she signed on for. She reportedly was on set, constantly acting like a diva. One of the best examples was trailer size. She had her agent measure the size of her trailer with a tape measure versus Robert Davi's trailer and threw a fit that his was 10 feet larger than hers. It turned out Christian really didn't want to do the film and was only doing it because she desperately needed the money. Despite the troubles, filming continued. The scene in the convenience store was inspired by the grocery store opening in Cobra. They shot some scenes in New York without permits. After getting most of the New York footage, they moved to L.A. The strip club was a real strip club in L.A. near the airport. They hired the strippers as extras for the film to keep it authentic. The police station shootout was one of the scenes that really showed how much they ramped things up from the original. The first person killed in the police station was Lustig's brother Jason. They were getting ready to film one of the movie's biggest scenes, Riley being handcuffed and dragged by a driverless car. Years earlier, Lustig saw the Jackie Chan movie, Police Story. In the beginning of the film, a woman gets handcuffed to the steering wheel of a car. He thought they were going to roll it downhill, but they didn't. So he took that idea and filmed the version he had in his head. For some of the shots, Christian would be outside the car being dragged. They set it up so she'd be kneeling on a platform connected to the door, and the car was in a harness being pulled by a truck. On the third take, the platform breaks, and she hits the road at something like 30 or 40 miles per hour, still handcuffed to the steering wheel. She was dragged on the platform, and aside from being shaken, she seemed okay. The next day, while shooting a scene, a gush of blood began pouring down her legs. She ran to the bathroom, and then had to be rushed to the hospital. She was having a miscarriage. As a principal actor, whenever you shoot a film, one of the first things they do is give you a physical. If you pass the physical, then they give you the okay to be insured for the film. When Christian was given her physical, she allegedly didn't mention that she was pregnant. She had a copy of the script prior to doing the filming, so she knew it would be a physically demanding role, but took it anyways. Lustig and the producers had no idea that she was three months pregnant. With this revelation, they lost their insurance. They had already shot most of the film, so they couldn't hire another actress and reshoot Christian's scenes. It would be too expensive. The production was on hold while she recovered. This was a union shoot, so even though they weren't filming, everyone was still being paid. The producers spoke to her, and she was libeled for a lawsuit. Lustig didn't want to lose the production, so in order for her to come back, they had to settle with her lawyer that they wouldn't sue her for damages caused by her holding back the information that she was pregnant. They estimated she cost the production about 200000 additional dollars because of this. With her back on set, they were able to continue. According to Christian, after she returned, Davi said, Now maybe you won't be such a hormonally imbalanced bitch. The big finale involved the maniac cop being set on fire during a prison break. It took three days to film. The ending was inspired by the ending of the 1951 film, The Thing from Another World, where the monster is running through the facility on fire. For one part, Lustig wanted to show Turkle being set on fire. The scene would involve Turkle getting touched by Cordell, and flames would shoot up his arm to where we see the actor's face. Rossi didn't want to do it. He went to Lustig and said, You do it? I'll do it. So Lustig put the glove on, they covered his arm in gel, and they lit it on fire. Rossi was upset. He said, I didn't think you'd do it. Being a man of his word, he did the stunt. Robert Zadar hated the makeup. One day he was speaking to Lustig and was having a breakdown. It took two hours to apply every day and was incredibly uncomfortable under the hot lights of the shoot. And whenever he ate something, food would get stuck between his skin and the mask. He told him he wanted to just rip the mask off. Lustig promised to make it up to him. If he toughed it out for the rest of the shoot, he'd pay to have him and his girlfriend fly to Hawaii for a vacation to relax after the movie. Robert Davi found out about this. And whenever he saw Zadar eating his liquid lunch, he'd taunt him with a delicious hamburger. And what I did was I started to eat a, uh, a hamburger. And I started going, mmm, this is delicious. Would you like a bite? The grand finale was something that had never been done before. Two stuntmen would be set on fire and fall several stories onto a bus. It was incredibly dangerous, but they managed to pull it off, and it looks amazing. It was now February. Lustig had six weeks to do post work and get the film edited before taking it to Cannes. He spent as much time as he could working days and nights to get it done. He had an assistant who was editing Die Hard 2 during the day 
and helping him work on Maniac Cop 2 at night. Lustig dedicated the film to Joe Spinell, the star of Maniac, who tragically died of a heart attack in 1989. At the end of the six weeks, he had a print ready for Cannes. The film screened and was a big hit. He spoke with the producers, and they had already recouped the film's budget with international distribution sales. New Line made them an offer for a theatrical release, but this was now 1990, and the home theater explosion was going on. Live Entertainment made them a better deal for the film to go direct-to-video. While the potential was there to make more money if the film did well theatrically, the studio went with a safe bet and took Live's deal. Lustig was sad because the film played everywhere in the world theatrically, except for the U.S. Maniac Cop 2 is a sequel that, despite major problems during the shoot, ended up being better than the already great original. Lustig said it's his best film, and I have to agree. The action, story, and over-the-top vibe make the film stand out. Maniac Cop 2 not only had more action, but it was incredibly bold, killing off two of the original heroes less than halfway through the film. Lustig said he wanted to make the movie move fast and keep your eyes engaged so you wouldn't notice all the plot holes. Claudia Christian went on to write a tell-all book in 2012 called Babylon Confidential. In it, she discusses the miscarriage, but doesn't mention that she didn't inform the studio that she was pregnant. Oh, and yes, Lustig kept his word and sent Zadar to Hawaii for a vacation. That way, he'd be plenty rested up to put on the makeup again in Maniac Cop 3. I knew it! I never should have let cops in my cab! 